taxonomy where we shall start off by looking at the introduction. Uh, I'm the one taking you through. I'm Judith Musebe. As we look at taxonomy, we shall begin with the introductory part of it. Now for introduction, taxonomy is a science. It is the science of classifying living things. Now the study of living things is normally called biology and there are many different kinds of living things. So you'll find living things also being referred to as biodiversity. So in taxonomy then you say it is the science of classifying living things or we can also say it is the science of classifying biodiversity. As we classify the living things, every living thing is given a name and then it is actually placed in a particular group, we call them taxonomic groups, according to similarities and differences. So we end up with taxonomy now having two branches. One, nomenclature, where we are naming the living things or organisms. And two, systematics, where the living things are being placed into groups according to their characteristics. So those with similar characteristics are placed in the same group and we end up with the different groups. As we talk about taxonomy, there are four main activities that uh, take place in taxonomy. One, we talk about describing the organism or description of the organism. Two, the other activity is identification of the organism. Thirdly, we have the activity of naming the organism. And the fourth activity is the activity of classification of the organism. When you talk about description of an organism, it is also referred to as characterization because this involves looking for and listing the characteristics of a given organism. A characteristic is a distinguishable feature that an organism has, a feature an organism has that makes it to be distinct. So as you list down the characteristics of an organism, that gives us the activity of taxonomy, which is description. Now the second activity we talked about was identification. Identification is about trying to find out the identity of the organism or the living thing you are dealing with. And identification is normally done based on the characteristics that the organism has. Now as we do identification, because an organism you are trying to identify, you identify using references and also using its characteristics. The references we can make to as we identify an organism, we have, you can make use of similar specimens, you can make use of drawings, we can make use of photographs, we can make use of what we call taxonomic keys or diagnostic keys. Uh, a taxonomic key is basically a reference book that is made with a group of organisms that are already clearly identified and their features clearly indicated. So as you try to identify a new organism, you can make use of these taxonomic keys or reference books as we put them to try and find out the organism you're dealing with. And lastly, you can also refer to other scientists who also do taxonomy or classification of living things. Normally, you'll find such scientists in herbaria all over the world. So you can send the organism to them and they can help you to identify the organism you're dealing with. The third activity was naming of the organism. <coughs> As you name the organism, we are not talking about the common name. Here, we are talking about the scientific naming of the organism, and we name it using binomial nomenclature, which is a system of scientific naming of living things. As we name the organism, it is guided by certain criteria. And the guidelines provided in naming organisms are provided in what we refer to as international codes. So as you talk about naming the organism, therefore, you name it guided by the international codes of nomenclature. Now, once you have done the first three steps, you have described the organism, we have identified the organism, we have named the organism according to binomial nomenclature, guided by international codes. Then we do the last activity, which is classification. 
we now place the organism in particular specific taxonomic categories. The taxonomic categories we talk about seven. We place the organism according to its characteristics in a particular kingdom and then in a particular phylum or a division, in a particular class, in a particular order, in a particular family, in a particular genus, and then we have the species name that will have given the organism. So when you talk about placing the organism in a group, we are placing it in a specific taxonomic category, right from the highest group, which is the kingdom, to the lowest one, which is the species level. So these are the main activities that are involved in taxonomy. Now, depending on how many of those four activities in taxonomy that you've conducted on a given organism, we end up with four levels of taxonomy, also referred to as the phases of taxonomy. Levels of taxonomy, you have got three. Alpha taxonomy, that is the first level. Beta taxonomy and gamma taxonomy. If you only I describe an organism, identify it, and then give it a name, which are the first four activities in taxonomy, if that is only due to an organism, then that kind of taxonomy gives us alpha taxonomy. It is the simplest level of taxonomy. Now, if you describe an organism, you identify it, you name it, and then you place it in specific taxonomic categories, that is, you classify it, then that gives us beta taxonomy. That is the second level of taxonomy, and it is higher level compared to alpha. And then we know, for some organisms, the species is supposed to be a single type organism. But the members of a species can have small differences in them that are variations. So in case you're trying to basically classify an organism in a species that has got variations, now you're talking about subspecies, then we can now try to actually differentiate, analyze, and group the members of a species based on their variations or differences. So when you classify members of a species based on their variations, then that gives us what we refer to as gamma taxonomy. Now, because in gamma taxonomy, you are basically analyzing and classifying members of the same species, it is also referred to as study of speciation. Gamma taxonomy is the highest level of taxonomy. Not many organisms are classified to gamma level of classification. Most of them, the classification is done in the alpha level and at the beta level. Now, when it comes to classification of living things. It didn't begin, begin recently, it began long time ago. So we've got a history of classification, what has been done from the earlier days up to what we have now that we are using in classification. And classification basically began with the natural historians. These were basically people in the community who basically retained information and conserved information about living things in the community. Now, for the natural historians, as they are busy retaining and conserving information about living things, they began with the plants and for a reason. Because the plants were important for medicinal value and for agricultural value, because a number of them happened to be food plants. So as we talk about classification currently, we have got many other living things that have been classified, but it began with plants because of medicinal value and agricultural value, and then slowly moved into the other living things. Many natural historians contributed to the classification of living things as you know it today. But I'd like us to look at the last two contributors because what they gave us is what we are using mostly as we do modern day classification. So I look at the contribution specifically of um, Carolas Linnaeus. And the contributions Carolas Linnaeus made is Many early historians had tried to name living things, and even one of them actually introduced binomial nomenclature, but it was inconsistent, it was not working well. A number had tried to introduce categories or groups into which living things could be placed, but it was not very systematic. So Carolus Linnaeus now contributed by now introducing and actually 
introducing consistency into binomial nomenclature, he now was able to use binomial nomenclature in a consistent manner. We are now, he told us, every living thing has got a two-part name. Reason why we call it binomial. First part of the name, the name of the genus. Second part of the name, the name of the species. He also gave us the categories into which we can group our living things, giving us what we call the taxonomic categories or the taxonomic ranks. And he gave us seven taxonomic categories that we use today. Basically, in descending order, we have got the kingdom, we have got the phylum or division, we have got the class, we have got the order, we have got the family, the genus, and the species. And finally, he introduced the kingdom system. After categorizing living things, he finally said, okay, living things can belong to two kingdoms. Kingdom animalia, which is consisting of animals, and kingdom plantae, consisting of plants. According to Carolus Linnaeus, anything that could move was placed in kingdom animalia. Anything or living thing that could not move was placed in kingdom plantae. But the challenge with the two kingdoms Carolus Linnaeus gave is that not all living things could fit in the two kingdoms. There are a number of organisms that are put in the animal kingdom. For example, the euglena were put in the animal kingdom. And other small unicellular flagellates were put in the animal kingdom because they could move using the flagellum. But you'll find a number of them also had other characteristics that were not in line with the rest of the animals. Fungi had been put in kingdom plantae because they could not move. But then you find the fungi could not make their own food the way the other plants were doing. They were heterotrophic, while the other plants were basically autotrophic. So they could not fit in either of the two kingdoms that were given by Carolus Linnaeus. Now, based on the challenges that were observed with Carolus Linnaeus, we have the other natural historian who contributed to classification, that is Thomas Whitaker. Now, Thomas Whitaker distinguished that uh, the two kinds of cells that can be found in living things, that is the eukaryotic cell and the prokaryotic cell, where if a cell has got a distinct nucleus that is enclosed by a membrane and has distinct organelles, then that is a eukaryotic cell. If a cell does not have a distinct nucleus and lacks organelles, then that is a prokaryotic cell. So Thomas Whitaker distinguished the two main types of cells that we find in living things, the eukaryotic cell and the prokaryotic cell. He then, based on the challenges observed with the two kingdom system, introduced three more kingdoms to take care of the more living things. So now he gave us what we call the five kingdom system where in addition to kingdom animalia and kingdom plant that had been given by Carolus Linnaeus, he now added on the kingdom fungi for the fungi, the kingdom protoctista for small unicellular organisms that could not fit either in, the, in any of the other kingdoms, and then kingdom monera, which basically comprises of the bacteria. Now out of the five kingdoms, all the kingdoms basically have a eukaryotic cell, except kingdom monera, which have got a prokaryotic cell. Now, the contributions of Carolus Linnaeus and Thomas Whitaker are the main ones we use in modern day classification. Now, classification has become so important until now we actually study it as a serious branch of science as taxonomy. And ideally, the purpose of classification is to create order in the many living things by putting them into groups. So we do have the objectives of classification as it tries to put order in the living things. And the objectives of classification, we have got five. Number one, it helps us to clarify the relationship between the living things or organisms. Classification also the other objective is to help us remember organisms and their traits or characteristics. And this is because every individual organism has got its own characteristics and there are so many living things. If you are to remember the characteristics of every individual living thing, that would be too much information to remember. But because we can put them in taxonomic categories that we are using provided by Carolus Linnaeus, we can easily remember the characteristics of a group 
especially from the larger groups. And that would easily help us to remember or actually take into consideration the characteristics of an individual organism. Like, for example, if you know an organism is an animal, rather than remember the specific traits, we can simply remember the characteristics of the phylum it belongs to, and that will accommodate the characteristics of the individual organism. The other objective of classification is it enables us to communicate clearly the identity of an organism that one is studying. Because there are specific characteristics that we use as far as classification is concerned. So it makes it easy to communicate using these characteristics the identity of an organism being studied. It, that objective is it helps us to improve our predictive powers. Right now there are so many organisms you know. We know the kingdoms they belong to, the phylum, the classes and orders and so on that they belong to. So by knowing the characteristics of the various kingdoms that we know, the various phyla that we know, the various classes that we know, even up to the various genera that we know, it is easy now when you come across a new organism today, based on the characteristics you know of the different taxonomic groups that we have, for you to predict what this organism is likely to be. A quick look at the characteristics, you can quickly decide whether this animal is probably a plant or an animal or whatever you may think it is. By looking at a further at its characteristics, you can even decide if it's an animal. You may say, I think this is probably a mammal based on the characteristics of mammals that you know. So with the knowledge that we have in classification, it helps us basically to have very good predictive powers. The other objective of classification is to provide stable name for organisms. Stable names because we name living things based on binomial nomenclature. So all living things, they have got one scientific name, and therefore that gives them a stable name that can be used in a universal manner. So objects of classification basically are those five. Now if you are to talk about what is the importance of classification, the importance of classification is derived from the objectives of classification. If you have to say why classification is important, we could simply say it is important because it helps us to clarify the relationship among organisms. It is important because it helps us to remember organisms and their traits. It is important because it enables us to communicate clearly the identity of an organism being studied. It is important because it improves our predictive powers. Classification is important because it provides stable names to living things. So importance of classification can be directly derived from the objectives of classification. As we go through the introductory part, we remind ourselves of the taxonomic hierarchies. We have the seven categories that we can group our organisms in. And these categories range from the kingdom to the species, and you are given the categories by Carolus Linnaeus. Now the categories tend to actually move in a progressive manner. So because they go in a progressive manner, therefore you refer to them as taxonomic hierarchy. It's a hierarchy of categories where you can place an organism in. Now for these categories that you also refer to as taxonomic ranks or taxonomic levels in descending order, we have got the kingdom being the largest category with so many organisms in it, the phylum, the class, the order, the family, the genus, and then the smallest taxonomic category is the species. Such that we have the kingdom is divided based on the similarities and differences in the organisms into smaller groupings we call the phyla. The phyla again are divided into smaller groupings based on similarities and differences of the organisms into classes. Classes divided into orders, orders divided into families, families divided into genera, plural of genus, and finally, the species. Now, species is comprises of a single type of organism. So ideally, we would expect members of a species to be the same. But because of variations between individual members of a species, we may have them, members of a species having small differences amongst themselves. So although we have got seven taxonomic categories from kingdom to species, 
Should a species have variations, then we introduce an extra subset that we refer to as the subspecies or varieties. If you are dealing with animals, we talk about subspecies. If it's plants, it is varieties. For the other organisms, it may vary between subspecies or varieties. Either of the two can be applicable. To remind ourselves of binomial nomenclature. Binomial means two. Nomenclature means naming. So binomial nomenclature basically is a system of the scientific naming of living things where every living thing has a two-part name, with the first part of the name being the genus name, and the second part of the name being the species name. The genus name begins with a capital letter. The species name begins with a small letter. Both names are either italicized or they can be underlined separately. Then the name is it Latinized, meaning it is in the Latin language. So with the scientific name of an organism, it is the same no matter which part of the world we are referring it from, it has got one scientific name. Now, for the species name, the species name normally identifies or describes something about the organism. So you'll find the species name therefore being referred to also as species identifier. It may describe the location where the organism is found in abundance, or the location where the organism was found for the first time, or it may be describing the person who actually gave the particular species a name, or a particular characteristic about that particular species. So the species name always describes something about the organism, therefore it's a species identifier. For example, the scientific name of human is Homo sapiens. Sapiens means intelligent or wise. So what the scientific name here is basically telling us about the human being is that the human being is intelligent and is wise. Now, <clears throat> because you're talking about the species and sometimes species can have variations, so we end up with subspecies or varieties. And uh, we are saying binomial nomenclature gives organisms a two-part name. First part, genus name. Second part, species name. In case a species has got varieties or variations, so we have got a subspecies here, then you may find binomial nomenclature may not hold because we cannot ignore the existence of the subspecies. So instead of the scientific name of the organism having two parts, it now ends up having three parts. First part, the genus name. Second part, the species name. And then the third part, the subspecies name. Again, the name still guided by the international codes. So based on this fact that some names may not fit into the two-part naming system of binomial nomenclature, this gives us one of the limitations of binomial nomenclature. And there are many other limitations that binomial nomenclature has. For example, you do know some organisms may end up sharing the same generic name, yet they are not related to one another, and other limitations as well. Now, as you talk about binomial nomenclature, <coughs> We talked about their rules of naming organisms and they're guided by international codes. So when you talk about an international code, this is simply rules that are provided by world scientific bodies that guide the scientific naming of organisms. And because you have got different types of living things, therefore you have got different types of scientific bodies that have provided the rules of naming the different types of living things. So as such, we end up having different types of international codes. And every international code decides what is the, the valid name of a given organism. Valid name for the species, valid name for the genus, valid name up to the family level. So we end up having currently 
for existing international codes. So I've got an international code that guides the naming of plants. That one gives us the international code of botanical nomenclature. Now, lately, around 2007, this particular code was modified to also accommodate the naming of the algae and the fungi. So now you also find it being referred to as International Code of Nomenclature of Algae, Fungi, and Plants. It guides the naming of the plants, the algae, and the fungi. And then you have the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature, which guides the naming of animals. There is the International Code of Cultivated Plants. Cultivated plants are plants that are purposely grown by man for a given purpose. So there is a code for naming such plants, the International Code of Cultivated Plants. And then you have the International Code of Bacteria Nomenclature, which guides the naming of bacteria. Now, for the four international codes, they are provided for by different scientific bodies, and they are not related to one another. So for that reason, therefore, they don't refer to one another at all. So for that reason, it is possible to find unrelated organisms sharing a generic name. So you may find a plant and an animal having the same generic name, because the scientific codes that guide their naming are basically independent of one another. Now, as you talked about identification of organisms, basically we identify organisms using the observable characteristics. The characteristics we make use of are things such as the shape, things such as the structure, things such as um, the color, and so on. Now, as you talk about identifying organisms using their characteristic, we had said a characteristic as far as taxonomy is concerned is a distinguishable feature that an organism has. So for a characteristic to qualify as a good characteristic to use in classification, it must have certain qualities. Now, for the qualities of a good characteristic to use in classification, we say, number one, it should be external, so that one doesn't require so much resources to be able to see this particular characteristic. Two, it should be easily observable, can be seen easily. Third quality, it should be constant. That is a characteristic that does not vary with environmental conditions, such that in one season it is present and in another season it is not present or it is absent. We need one that is constant throughout, exists in that particular organism in all seasons. Third, fourth characteristic or good quality of a good characteristic is that it should exist in more than one form. If it exists in more than one form, it makes it easy for us to be able to distinguish the various organisms that we have. And lastly, it should be able to be used either qualitatively or quantitatively. When you simply say a characteristic is present or it is absent, that is using a characteristic qualitatively. But when you assign a numeral or a number to the characteristic, such that you talk about and the number of legs present, then that is using the characteristic quantitatively. So it should be able to be used either qualitatively or quantitatively. If I pick the example of the legs, if you just say legs present or legs absent, that is using the characteristic of legs, but qualitatively. But when you assign a number to the characteristic, you now talk about three pairs of legs present, uh, many pairs of legs present, then that is using the same characteristic of legs but assigning it a number, that is now using it quantitatively. So for a characteristic to be good for use in classification, it must have the five qualities. External, easily observable, should be constant, exist in more than one form, and can be used either qualitatively or quantitatively. Hmm. Now, as you're busy identifying organisms using the characteristics you have talked about, we say as you identify organism, we can use what we refer to as taxonomic or diagnostic keys that use as a reference point to identify the organism. Now, when it comes to taxonomic keys, 
We define a taxonomic key simply as a tool that assists one to identify an organism. And there are different types of taxonomic keys. We have got one, single access key, also called the dichotomous key. You have got the multi-access keys, and you've got the tabular keys. And remember before you come to identification, you said you must have described the organism first, having listed down its characteristics. So as you're busy trying to identify it, we have the characteristics with us. Now to differentiate the different types of taxonomic keys, <coughs> We start with the single access key or the dichotomous key. Now, basically, a dichotomous key is a system of identifying organisms whereby the organisms are split into two successive groups at every stage based on a certain distinguishable feature. So at every point, use one characteristic to divide the organisms into two groups of almost equal size. Now, in this particular key, because you're dividing the organisms into two groups at every point, that is the reason it's referred to as dichotomous. In this particular key, at every step, one character is used at a time. So used one feature or one character at a time. Now, because you're using one characteristic at a time, that is why it is referred to as single access key. Now, the one generating this key decides which characteristic to start with and which should follow the other. As such, therefore, for single access key, the structure of the key, the structure and sequence of steps in the key are determined by the author of the key. It is the simplest and most commonly used taxonomic key. And there are two types of single access keys. It can be a spider key, or it can be a linear key. Spider key comprises of a branch diagram. Linear key comprises of statements whereby each statement is based on one characteristic and it is given a number and it has got two parts which have got the same characteristic but giving its contrasting features. So for the single access key, uses one characteristic at a time Steps are determined by the author. Multiple access key. We call it multiple access key because many characteristics or features are used at the same time in identifying the organism. So you'll find here, because you're using many characteristics at a go, the structure and sequence of this particular key is not predetermined. So it is not determined by the author. For this particular key, because it's using many characteristics at a go, it is more complicated than the single access key. But the advantage it has is that because you're using many characteristics at a go, it is possible to identify an organism even if one of the characteristics is missing for one reason or another. Also, it can be tailored to a specific organism being identified or the specific environment within which an organism is being identified. So it is complicated, but it is advantageous compared to the single access key. And then lastly, we have the tabular key. Now tabular key is when you do a key that does a combination of single access and multiple access. In some parts of the key, you use a single characteristic at a time to identify the organism and divide them into groups. At another point in the key, you use many characteristics at a go as you identify the organisms. So you've got a key combining the two, single access and multiple access, then that gives us the tabular key. A little talk about the characteristics used in identification. We can derive the characteristic to use in identification from a variety of resources. One, we can make use of external structures. These are things like the legs in the case of animals, things like the wings, and so on. External structures are easy to see because they are on the outside. For smaller insects to see the external structure characteristics well, you may, one may need to use a microscope 
or a watch glass for magnifying purposes. We can also make use of the cell structure to identify and actually classify organisms. In the cell structure, we can make use of things such as the difference in the cell wall. For example, you know plants have got a cell wall that is made up of cellulose, while fungi have got a cell wall containing chitin. So differences in the cell wall of organisms can be used to basically identify and even classify organisms. We can make use of things like um, the chromosomes, the number of chromosomes in the nucleus of the cell. So the chromosomes can be used actually to identify different organisms and distinguish them from one another. We can also make use of chemical composition. Chemical composition is where you pick a chemical within the living things that is common in a number of living things, and then based on the differences in its structure in the different living things, you can now use that to distinguish and identify the various living things that you have. Examples of chemicals that are normally used a lot in identifying organisms are the proteins. Reason, proteins are made up of amino acids. And the amino acids in a protein are different and they can be organized in a different manner. They can have a different sequence. So we can isolate a pattern for different organisms. And then by looking at the sequence of the amino acids in this specific protein, we can use that to distinguish the different organisms that we are dealing with. We can also use the characteristic of immunological reactions. Immunological reactions is referring to the antibody antigen reactions, where every living organism has got an immune system which gives it immunological reactions. So based on the similarities of the immunological reactions that different organisms have, we can use that to distinguish and even relate the different organisms that we have such that if you see a particular immunological reaction in a given organism, we can classify it as a particular organism and identify it as such. We can also make use of behavioral responses. Basically, we can identify and even classify organisms depending on how they behave when they are exposed to a particular stimulus, such that those that give the same behavior to a particular stimulus we can say they are similar to one another and group them together. Those with a different behavior to the same stimulus can be said to be different and put in a different group. So there are many other ways that you can, characteristics you can use in identification, but these are the main ones that are normally used. We can either make use of an external structure, the cell structure, the chemical composition, or we can make use of immunological reactions or behavioral responses. When you're trying to identify an organism, the process of identification. Now, basically, because classification is, um, and taxonomy is a field of science on its own, you have got scientists who specifically go out there, pick organisms, and then come and try to classify them, identify them, and even classify them. So the basic process of doing identification begins from where you're going to actually collect your sample. And before you can go collect the samples you want to identify, before you leave, you must, number one, decide what kind of samples you want to collect. So step number one is deciding on the type of sample. Do you want to go and collect an animal sample or a sample of plants or fungi or algae or bacteria? Now, once you decide on the type of sample, that is important because it determines the kind of equipment that you carry with you to the field. Once you decide on that, you go to step two, which is going, going to the field and doing the actual sample collection and organization. Collection is where you pick the samples. Organization is where you order your samples. In the field, you must have an order of your samples. You can name them and label them from sample one and so on and even indicate the specific place where you collected a specific sample from. So you have to organize the samples. And then step three, you have got these samples that you've collected. They have got so many characteristics in them. Step three now, you determine and list down the characteristics that you want to use 
for the classification and identification process. Once you've decided the ones you want to use and you've listed them, you go to step four. Step four now, based on the list of characteristics you have identified, you now look at each samples that you have, the specimens in the sample, and then determine which of these characteristics of choice you have are either present or absent in every specific sample. So now you make a table where you have your samples on one side and you have the characteristics on the other hand and you simply indicate by either a tick and an X which of the characteristics of choice is present in the samples that you have. Now once you do that, that gives us what we call the data matrix which comprises step four where the presence and absence of the different characteristics are presented on a data matrix. The data matrix gives you a quick visual view of the samples that you have and the characteristics of choice that each one of them has and which ones it is missing. Now once that is in place, step five, you now look at the organisms that you have and use the characteristics now to identify and split the organisms that you have into groups. So those with similar characteristics are put in the same group. And that basically forms the basis of taxonomy. That splitting of organisms into groups based on their characteristics is the basis of taxonomy. To sum up the introductory part, you have got the types of classification. Now I said there are basically two main categories of classification. One, artificial classification, and two, natural classification. Artificial classification is based with where organisms are basically classified based on one or very few observable characteristics. Natural classification is where organisms are classified based on the characteristics that are present naturally in that particular organism. So basically natural classification is based on the natural relationship between organisms because we shall be looking at the similarities and differences that they have based on their naturally existing characteristics. This includes things such as the cell structure, the chemical composition, the morphology, that is the form, and so on. Now with these two categories of classification, that is artificial and natural, Taxonomy uses natural classification. Natural classification, we have got three types of natural classification. Number one, you have got phylogenetic classification, also referred to as evolutionary classification or cladistics. Two, we have got numerical classification, also referred to as phonetic classification. And the third one is orthodox classification. To differentiate the three types of natural classification, we have phylogenetic is basically where we are classifying organisms based on evolutionary relationships alone. So one looks at organisms that are from the same ancestor and then based on their similarities and differences, basically puts them into groups. So we end up with them developing a branch diagram comprising of the ancestor and their descendants, giving us what we call a family tree or a phylogenetic tree. For phylogenetic classification, they ignore any other characteristic the organisms may have and only use characteristics based on evolutionary relationships. So as one goes out to do phylogenetic, already it is predetermined the kind of characteristics they are going to use. The second type, numerical or phonetic classification. Numerical classification is where organisms are classified based on any characteristic that they have. So and it is therefore based on many characteristics and any characteristic is applicable. And the more the characteristic one uses in this classification, the more valid the classification becomes. So because it uses many characteristics, that is why we refer to it as numerical classification. Because you use any characteristic that is applicable in this classification, 
The characteristic used are not predetermined. That is why it is referred to as phonetic classification. And as you said, the more characteristics you use, the more valid the classification becomes. The last one, orthodox classification. Orthodox is a combination. When one combines phylogenetic and phonetic classification, then that becomes orthodox classification. Meaning you're classifying organisms based on evolutionary relationships, if you find them, and also based on any other characteristic that is applicable that you will find. So when you combine phylogenetic and phonetic, then that becomes orthodox classification. And taxonomy mainly uses orthodox classification. And with that, we come to the end of lesson one. Thank you and stay safe. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then, email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.